Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis, a breaking news reporter here at Forbes. Joining me now is Charles Lipson, Professor Emeritus at the University of Chicago. Charles, thanks so much for joining me. My pleasure. My answers will be completely different uh, from last time, Brittany. My values haven't changed, but I've read the polls. I see what you're doing, and you're alluding to <laughs> Vice President Kamala Harris's first media interview with Governor Walz since President Biden dropped out of the race. Try to say that three times fast. But big night last night. It was an almost 30-minute overall interview. What are some of your takeaways? Uh, m my f uh, first takeaway is that I read a lot of conservative commentary that it was a disaster. I didn't think so. I thought it was close to a nothing burger. She made a uh, one or, uh, she made only one word salad, uh, but I thought it was uh, really embarrassing for Dana Bash. I thought it was just an awful interview on her part. Now, I'll tell you why. Uh, I once gave a talk at a, a university where uh, prosperous kids that uh, weren't all that bright went to uh, college and they would ask me, I gave a, a little talk to a seminar and they would ask a question and then you would give an answer and I've given this this kind of a talk at many different universities and when the kids are smarter and more engaged they would ask a follow-up question. You're listening to me right now if I said something that was interesting or provocative or raised a question, you, as a serious interviewer, would ask the follow-up. You would press on it, not in a negative way, but that's your job as a journalist. I thought that Dana Bash just let the first answer, which was always a canned answer from Kamala Harris, She's, she's more polished now than she used to be. She would give a canned answer. It demanded a follow-up, and Dana uh, Bash would just move on to the next question. So I thought it was, in effect, pretty close to a nothing burger, but that was because of a bad interviewer. I know that obviously I watched the interview and she asked a few follow ups on the economy, a few about the flip flop and fracking. But one of my biggest takeaways is Kamala Harris's version of the of turning the page on the last decade. She said she was talking about Trump. She was saying that she wants to move on from this 10 years. But I mean, she has been serving in the administration for the last three and a half. So what do you think is her message about change and something new and a new way forward when she's been serving the White House most previously? That's exactly right. Except for the four years of the Trump presidency, this whole era was a Democratic presidency. So she's skipping over. Uh, her Senate years and her White House years. Um, that, that has two purposes. One is to excuse her from any connection with uh, the Biden White House without actually saying that because it would be implausible to say it. And the second is to point out that Trump is the candidate of the past. Trump should embrace that and say, but it was a past that was better. It was, uh, are you better off now than you were four years ago? That, that should be his response. But, uh, but he, he has yet to settle on his main themes of his attack on Kamala Harris. And I don't know that he will until after the September 10th interview. But I thought that you're right. She did, uh, uh, Dana Bash did ask uh, two or three uh, follow-up questions, but she didn't really press on the inadequacies of certain answers. I'm not saying that in a partisan way. I'm saying that uh, just in terms of what a journalist's responsibility should be. And I thought Tim Waltz, Tim Waltz is a very presentable guy. He's, he's warm and he's friendly in a way that I don't 
know that m most voters would think that Kamala Harris is. There's an authenticity about him, but he was basically there as an, emo an emotional support vice president. <laughs> what I mean, did he make you know? of that? Because it's CNN posted the um, the interview in three parts. I believe the first part, he might have had one question. I don't know if any more. The second part, maybe one question, Max. And then the third part, he was asked about his service record, amongst other things, amongst that. And then the moment at the DNC with his son. Do you think this moved the needle in terms of him at all? Well, I thought that his purpose there was partly to introduce him more uh, to the nation. But I thought it, his bigger purpose was to divert some of the questions so that she wouldn't have to answer as many questions. And on this, I, uh, I congratulate uh, Dana Bash for basically staying focused on the number one candidate. Uh, I thought that uh, Waltz handled the fact that he had been deceitful on uh, some of his public statements. I thought he handled that very well. That is, they, those were polished answers. He skipped around uh, the real issues and uh, got away with it. Uh, but that's, uh, that's to his credit. And, uh, but in general, I would say that vice president, people don't vote on vice presidents. And I thought it was right that Dana Bash focused on, on on Kamala Harris, and I think if you had had that interview, you wouldn't have directed many uh, questions at Walt. You would have had questions for uh, uh, Vice President Harris, and I think that the main two questions are: How do you escape responsibility for this administration? and in particular for the areas that you had primary responsibility, such as the border. And uh, how uh, do you, what is the actual underlying reason other than political expediency that you've actually changed so many of the positions you're on the record uh, as advocating? Those are the two main questions Trump will need to push those uh, questions in the upcoming interview. Before we move on to her, before we move on to her, I just want to finish up with Walls before we um, just go full out um, talking about Kamala Harris. Do you think that his response to the question about his service record and whether he inflated that, do you think that came off as a dodge? What do you think that looked like? Because essentially he said for that and the IUI IVF question, you know, I, I don't speak correctly. Sometimes my wife says I have poor grammar, but people know what I mean. It was a total dodge. It wasn't an answer to the question. He, well, how do you explain uh, to somebody that you actually lied? Uh, uh, he also had, and she didn't push on this, he had a DUI uh, conviction. Um, and I just think, and she didn't ask about his response and hers to all the uh, Black Lives Matter aftermath with the burning of the city and, and so forth. Um, the, uh, Minneapolis used to be basically a crime-free city, and uh, that, but that was two decades ago, and now things have deteriorated very badly for a number of reasons, but in, uh, he's part of the problem, not part of the solution. But again, I don't, uh, I think she should have pressed on some of those issues. If she was going to ask him anything at all, she should have pressed on those issues. Uh, but, uh, but again, the, the big dog is Kamala Harris and, and that was, it was right to concentrate on her. And so now let's concentrate on her too. For questions about the economy, uh, she said she agreed that prices were too high. I mean, and then was that she was asked, well, you're in charge right now, essentially. So what do you do about it now? What do you do when people say, hey, let's go back to the Trump economy? Do you think her answer was sufficient there? Well, no, because she doesn't have an answer. Um, 
uh, if you bought something um, for a dollar at your local um, big supermarket, right, and uh, the supermarket didn't get any profit at all, it would sell for about 98 cents, not a, do not a dollar, okay? Uh, and if you go all the way back through the food chain, <laughs> literally the food chain, uh, you, and squeezed out all the profits, you wouldn't get down very far. It's a very competitive business. And prices have gone up because the Biden administration flooded the economy with money. And their answer to why they did it is that there was a COVID crisis, but the COVID crisis had, had passed by the time they flooded the economy. And um, they, uh, now Trump, Trump mishandled the COVID crisis in a number of ways as well. So I'm not excusing him, but they, the inflation is on their watch. And her main responses on the economy are uh, typical uh, democratic responses. We're going to do big government programs. We're going to spend a huge amount of money. It's going to help the poor people most. And there's uh, there's a magical uh, unicorn that will lower prices in the midst of all this. It's just it, it it's it's incredible. It it doesn't work, and it never has, and it won't work this time. It's not as if, by the way, Trump doesn't have uh, proposals that would also bust the budget, but. Their Republican programs, in effect, they ask you to spend your money, not not for you to give the money to me, the government, and I will spend it for you. So these are two different uh, approaches to the way she's going to do things. But to the extent that she says um, that um, that she's going to bring inflation down. It's just all smoke and mirrors. She she hasn't said how she's going to do it. She's not going to spend less money. So how exactly? Another thing that she was asked about a flip-flopping position was fracking. She's also had a changing stance on immigration. Do you think that she answered either of those questions sufficiently? Because we know fracking is a huge issue in Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania will be a must-win for her. And obviously, immigration is one of the top issues facing the country. Well, her answer on fracking was dishonest. She said, I've never, you know, I, she, she tried to pretend that she wasn't on record against fracking. By the way, when any politician says, uh, I've been perfectly clear, that it means they haven't been. It, when they say, to be honest, what are they referring to about their previous answers were those dishonest she she's saying i uh, i've always been uh uh in favor of a fracking just just look at the record well look at the record she was very clear not just once but repeatedly and um so i thought she was in uh i thought that was a a, a problem and should have been uh press but 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 her answer is kind of now on the record on immigration she's um she's right to press trump for he helping kill a compromise bill but the correct response by the interviewer to press that is we have something like between eight and 10 million people who've entered the country illegally during the Biden-Harris administration. Almost all of those entered illegally during the period before this compromise bill. So you might be right that there was a partial solution going forward, but how do you explain the fact that your administration 
and what you and your role in it uh, allowed this many people into the country. And now your administration is pushing for ways to let them all become voters going forward. So there's a lot to press there. And Dana Bash just let it all uh, hang out without any really serious follow-up. So I, uh, again, I thought Kamala Harris is being a professional. She's getting away with uh, twist and shout. Um, but um, but but that's what that's her job. She's she's a politician. She's not necessarily going to tell you the truth. She's going to give you the most uh, effective answer. By the way, I want to say one thing about energy costs because she's a big Green New Deal person. And there are two issues that could have been pressed there. One is that Detroit is going bankrupt over these EV mandates. And she hasn't changed her position that she's moving uh, toward a, a, a future where there will be no internal combustion cars at all. Okay, And Detroit is losing huge amounts. So she needs to be able to defend that to the voters in Michigan. And the second thing is that uh, they're essentially their anti uh, fossil fuels um, approach has revved up the price of gasoline. And a lot of the cost in a grocery, she's all in favor of, of squeezing out these uh, this price gouging. She can't define what price gouging is, but she's in favor, she's against it. Whatever it is, Groucho Marx had a song, whatever it is, I'm against it. Well, that's her position. But moving a can of soup uh, from, uh, from the uh, uh, tomatoes in, a, in the field to the Campbell's factory and then putting it in, uh, making a can, putting it in the can and moving that can to the supermarket entails a lot of fuel. And so part of the cost that the consumers are feeling is the cost uh, of all those 18 wheelers on the highway paying more for their gas. I do want to make some comparisons now between 2016 and 2024, because if we remember in 2016, Hillary Clinton was running against Donald Trump and a Part of Hillary Clinton's campaign was that she could be the first female president. And it feels like now, eight years later, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris isn't really leaning into her, her, her identity as much. When she was asked about Donald Trump questioning her race, she simply said this same old tired playbook next question and had nothing else to add. She also said at the end of the interview when um, Dana Bash asked what gender and race means to her, she said that she was the best person to do the job regardless of race and gender. What do you make of this strategy? First of all, I thought her answer on same old tired you know, basically same old tired Donald Trump was an excellent answer. I thought that that she did exactly what she needed to do in that answer. She's caught uh, his approach where he said, uh, you know, I didn't know she was black and so forth uh, was uh, a, a mistake uh, in, in the way he framed it and so forth. Um, she the Democratic Party is an identity politics party all the way down, right? That's been a major part of what they're doing. And they must have tested a lot of stuff on whether people think there's a glass ceiling that's holding back women from being elected to high office. But you can see throughout the Senate, there's, you know, huge number of women. It doesn't seem to be an issue. Uh, and so she must have tested that. And uh, I think in general, and I give her credit for this, she's not running for high office as a victim. And uh, I think that that's, that's part of it. And I don't, I think that the idea that I'm the torchbearer for women 
um, may have uh, sort of uh, m women already know that. By the way, there's a huge gender gap, and you can look at it in uh, that men are voting for Trump and women are voting for Kamala Harris, but it's a huge gender gap, and she must have felt that the uh, the disadvantages in terms of winning over men may have been greater if she had emphasized that. And she doesn't have to emphasize uh, being black because uh, voters can see that. I, I think that Trump made a mistake in the way that he framed it. Uh, she's multiracial and she went to a historically black college and so forth. Uh, I just think that the fact that she emphasizes both parts of her family is something to be proud of as we as Americans should be proud of all of this. And all the efforts uh, at identity politics are commendable to the extent that they ask us to be proud of who we are and uh, reprehensible to the extent that they uh, drive wedges between us uh, in our commonalities as Americans. In this regard, I would like to praise the Democrats at their convention for emphasizing patriotism. They emphasize that we are all Americans. And I thought that was a good thing and a kind of change of pace uh, for the way that the convention did it. And to your point, I mean, in that interview last night, she seemed to be making the Democratic Party, we're the big tent party, I'll have a Republican in my cabinet, this is my proposal, um, I, am, I will not ban fracking. Do you think right now Democrats are being the big tent party where Republicans could take a page from their playbook? Uh, I don't know what that's about. Uh, I think it's probably of a piece with her general idea that she can reposition who she is to the public, that she can say, I'm not this, uh, the, the far right calls her a communist. I think that's wrong. I think what she really is, Brittany, is a European democratic socialist very much like the uh, Democratic Socialist parties in Europe and like the Labor Party in Britain. They want a big government, high taxes, a lot of redistribution, and um, essentially a regulatory administrative state. And that's not uh, uh, Lenin. That's uh, a, a uh, a regulatory state with high taxes and a lot of redistribution. And I think what Americans um, haven't really come to grips with is that um, we used to have a relatively low tax economy um, uh, until after World War II. And we used to have a much more state and local uh, governance rather than national governance. That's all changed. And that presents a major problem uh, to conservatives who like to make small changes. But if they try only to make small changes, um, what will happen is that these issues will simply, the, the centralization and taxing power will all pause during a Republican presidential administration, but it won't be rolled back and we won't uh, move toward that. And uh, that's where I felt like, uh, again, Kamala Harris could have been pressed much harder on a number of, of those issues. Uh, I think she's still in favor uh, of all the things that the uh, that the Democrats have proposed. They'd like to blow up the Supreme Court. They'd like to blow up the filibuster in the Senate. Uh, they'd like to change a lot of the, uh, the remaining um, powers for the minority. And I think they really ought to think harder about that because they may be in the minority uh, at various times. And uh, they may be in the minority in the Senate 
Um, uh, they may be, uh, they currently are in the minority kind of on the Supreme Court. They've been de trying to delegitimize the Supreme Court. So I think these are very big issues. This is the starkest difference between the two parties since Franklin Roosevelt ran against Herbert Hoover. It's been a century almost. This is huge. And it is just political malpractice for the Republicans not to run on these issues. Because uh, except for abortion, they really, Republicans have uh, huge advantages on the issues. And Donald Trump has been making some interesting moves on the abortion fertility front and so forth. This advocacy for in vitro fertilization was very smart. And I think the right move. Um, and I think also his saying he would support uh, uh, a, uh, a referendum in Florida to roll back uh, this very restrictive policy on abortions, um, uh, which is, I think, now six weeks. And he would like to make it something on the order of 22, 24 weeks. These are very smart policies. And uh, I, I think he's right to emphasize them. You mentioned the stark party differences in this country, and you could really see that on play last night and tonight. If you were on Twitter, now known as X, if you were looking at right-leaning commentators, they said that was a softball interview full of word salad, nothing got accomplished. If you were looking at more democratic, more left-leaning commentators, they were lauding Vice President Kamala Harris. And as you know, not as many people today are watching cable news as they were in previous generations. So how is the rest of the media, do you think, interpreting this interview, especially because given the weight of this interview as it was her first one, and then explaining it and giving a consensus for those who aren't tuned into cable news every second of their lives? Well, you make a great point, which is uh, if you just listen to the right wing uh, media, you would have a sense that this is all a disaster. And if you listen to the left wing media, you would have a sense that she's the best politician since Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, I think that that simply reflects what our country is like now. Um, and I would say that in the past, the mainstream media was worth on the order of four or five points in a general election for their bias to the Democrats. Uh, I don't think, I, I doubt that's true anymore because the media is now fragmented. It's not as if ABC and CBS and so forth aren't doing exactly what they've done uh, over the years. And it's not like the New York Times and the Washington Post don't write their hard news stories to match their editorial. Of course they do. But uh, people just get their news from uh, sources that A, they think are reliable, and B, they think they're reliable in part because they already agree with the viewpoints uh, that are there. So I, um, uh, I, I think you're right. I, uh, by the way, I thought it was a softball interview, but then she hit the softballs correctly. So in a way, both are right. How do so I? So you're right, Charles. You're right yeah. down the middle. Yeah. <laughs> you got a little no, bit from well, this side, a little yeah. bit from that side. Well, you know, it's funny because I don't know how you do it, uh, Brittany, but after an event like that, which I can see with my own eyes, I uh, don't listen to the commentators. I, I try to think about it myself, and then maybe I'll listen to them. I haven't listened to them yet. I mean, that's a really interesting point. Personally, I watch whatever it is first to see it before it gets clouded by any type of commentary. And then I tune in to see what people are saying, which I personally think is the best strategy. There's still a lot of questions that need to be asked uh, between now and Election Day of Kamala Harris, of Governor Tim Walls. Ho hopefully people get the opportunity. Hopefully I even get the opportunity. But Charles Lipson, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate the conversation. I always enjoy it, Brittany, and you do ask follow-up <laughs> questions.